Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. we'll see if you do that at the end. Um, so I'm going to talk about mainly two projects today. Um, one, the Gotham Coyote Project, which I'm involved in along with many other, uh, many other colleagues. And that's an effort to study the ecology of coyotes as they uh, move in and colonize New York City. Um, and that's actually where this picture came from. This is a picture of a den in the Bronx uh, this past summer. Uh, they had five pups, and um, hopefully they're doing well. we'll I'll, I'll tell you more about them breeding in the city in a moment. Uh, the next project I want to kind of advertise or promote is this Wild Suburbia project. Right now, Wild Suburbia by itself is a citizen science effort we have going up um, upstate and actually also recently in the Midwest. And I kind of want to start something going in Long Island in the city, so I call it Wild Suburbia Metro. And I've got some flyers up here if you're interested. Uh, completely would, would love to talk to people about uh, partnerships, uh, getting schools involved, different nature reserves. So please see me, and uh, there's information right there in the front. So as many people, I'm sure everyone here uh, at least is somewhat aware, coyotes are, are moving into urban areas or, or, or have already done so all across the country, all across North America, pretty much. And this, for many reasons, I've listed a few, uh, but it basically boils down to the fact that they're super flexible, super adaptable, and very intelligent. Um, and they can reproduce uh, very rapidly if given the opportunity. And this not only goes for urban areas, it goes for pretty much everywhere. On the left uh, is a map of North America, obviously, and where we kind of think coyotes lived historically. And there's arguments about this. Some people um, say, no, there's definitely were coyotes on the West Coast, and even some who say there were probably some coyotes on the East Coast, but they're definitely concentrated in the prairies and the deserts, uh, kind of in between the Rockies and the Mississippi. And north and south to some degree. So they had a pretty impressive range to begin with. This is where they live today. So you can see that they're doing pretty well. And this is in the face of kind of the opposite of, of the bald eagles, at least recently. Uh, we've persecuted coyotes about as much as you possibly could ever do uh, of any species on, on Earth. Um, Last year, we killed, and this is only hunting licenses and recorded you know, ranchers or, or government uh, killed, 400,000. Doesn't include things like roadkill where you're not going to know. So we're killing the population of Minneapolis and coyotes every year, and this is what they do with that. <clears throat> so from a manager's perspective, this idea of coexistence as they move into new areas, in many cases, it's not very much an option. Um, I deal, I work in Westchester, so we've already got coyotes, and they're fairly common. And I talk to people all the time about how to live with coyotes. A lot of people say, I don't want to live with coyotes. And I said, well, I don't want to pay taxes, and I don't want to get up early, and I don't want to get to the airport two hours early, but I still kind of have to. I don't say that out loud. <laughs> So from that kind of original range, uh, there, for them to get to the East Coast, there seem to be two different historical routes. The ones that live in New York mainly came, mainly are descendants of ones that took this northerly route over the Great Lakes. And some people say, no, they went through the Great Lakes. But either way, they went northward and then came down. Um, when they went through Ontario, uh, people had suspected for a while, because the coyotes here on the East Coast are a little bit bigger, maybe they interbred with eastern wolves. And the genetics are telling us that that, that indeed was the case. Um, coyotes in this area, and this is a huge taxonomy um, genetics kind of debate, but I'll make it simple, up to 30% wolf genes in um, the coyotes here on the East Coast. Within New York, uh, they, got, they pretty much got through all of New York, that north-south 
uh, path, but also a little bit from the just straight east-west path through Ohio and Pennsylvania. By the 90s or the 2000s, they were into Westchester. Um, and then in the late 90s, 2000s, people started seeing um, sightings or making sightings in New York City. And that's kind of where we started our research. Uh, around 2010, 2011, um, we started the Gotham Coyote Project. We didn't name it that at the time. It was just kind of the weekend coyote project that we did on our free time. Myself, mainly myself, a researcher who's going to speak tomorrow, Mark Weckl from the Museum of Natural History, and then another woman, Ann Toomey, who's now in England, but she was a big help getting this off the ground. The main way we wanted to look for coyotes was using camera traps. Mark had had a lot of experience with camera traps uh, looking for jaguars in Central America. But again, this was not our day job. So we put cameras out, spent one weekend, and we came back two months later and picked them up. So they did the work for us. This is a really great way to see when animals are in uh, the neighborhood, uh, as long as you're sticking to mammals bigger than squirrels. Um, not too good for things like turtles or something. Uh, but you can learn more about the project at GothamCoyote.com. Uh, but in 2011 was the first year that we went really into New York City, and we, we looked at um, 15 or so parks from Westchester and the city together, southern Westchester, the really urban areas of Westchester. And we just ran the cameras for eight weeks, six or eight weeks, in one, because we only had about 10 cameras. We did one or two parks, and the next six or eight weeks put them in another one. So we did it sequentially. So we just kind of got a really quick snapshot of the city, and not too much surprisingly, but still interestingly, they were more concentrated in the Bronx than anywhere else. And the Bronx is the part that's connected to the mainland, so they can, they can walk there. Um, in 2012, we stuck to just 10, but we were able, we got some more cameras, we were able to do all of them all year with the help of one of our, grad, with a grad student from Pace, Suzanne Clemente. Uh, she ran them all year for us, so every month just went out, replaced the batteries, replaced the memory cards. And because we did it all year, we got to look at all of the parks during the breeding season. So we were able to say, where are we finding breeding and where are we not? And at that time, just the two really big parks in the northern Bronx, right on the border of Westchester, Van Cortland and Pelham Bay, which again, wasn't super surprising. If there's any place in the city I would have guessed they'd be breeding, it was in those two parks. But it still is the first uh, kind of official recording of, of coyotes breeding. Um, and again, if you talk to residents, they often will tell you years before there's these official pictures. But it's still, um, I think, important to have this documentation. So here, the biggest, like I said, biggest result of that year was these, these dens that we found in the Bronx. We also noticed kind of a pattern where out of all the parks, so this will be the proportion of parks that had a coyote at least once in that 14 year period from January 2012 to February 2013. Of all the parks that had at least one coyote, they were occupied in the winter time. When you got towards the warmer months, um, the number of parks that had coyotes went down. And this corresponded to when you saw pups. So this could have been a, a case that the, in the winter time, the adults, the few adults that are able to live in the Bronx can roam wherever they want. But then when they have to take care of dens and pups, they kind of keep their activity near the dens in those big parks in that really nice habitat. And then when the pups are gone, they go roaming again. It also could be a case, and it, these aren't necessarily exclusive, that you have pups that are born here, and then they leave. And the winter comes and we photograph them, but by the time the spring comes around, they're dead. So we photograph them in new places after they've dispersed, but they're just not sticking around or they're, or they're hit by a car by the time breeding season comes. So what we went with then was um, to do, since Suzanne was leaving us, and Mark and I could not do this uh, all on our own, um, we did eight-week survey. We moved in 2013, 2014, and, and now uh, to an eight-week survey in the winter to catch this maximum distribution period, and then an eight-week survey in the summer to see what parks are, have, have pups in them. So I won't show you every year, but this past summer 
was obviously our most recent. We've got cameras out right now for winter 2015. But we saw even more breeding. So over 2000, in 2013, we really didn't see much change, but we did see more occupied parks were occupied year round more often. And then we saw more breeding in Bronx Park and Ferry Point Park right on the foot of the Whitestone Bridge. So we're starting to see this increase in not only breeding, don't be, this is kind of a whacked out graph, but this would be the occupancy rate, so the proportion of parks that have coyotes, the top line during the non-breeding season, the winter season. And this is the breeding season occupancy rate, the circles um, during the summer. And then the red is the proportion of those parks that are occupied in the breeding season that actually have dens. So we're seeing that these two rates are approaching this steady rate of 80%. So what that basically means is that more parks are staying occupied all year round, and more of those year round occupied parks are having dens. And so this is kind of a steady growth. Um, so while the camera traps can't tell us the abundances, they can tell us, you know, site by site, are we seeing breeding? And that's basically uh, pretty good for predicting that the population is expanding. So obviously, what comes next? We've seen them do this all across North America, and so we can only assume that once if they can make it through New York City, they'll get out to Long Island. And if you look at Long Island, and you look at Westchester and Connecticut and all these other places where coyotes are doing quite well, Long Island looks like a great place to be a coyote, except for the highways. Um, so as propagule pressure builds in the Bronx, we expect them to show up. And if you were paying attention to the maps, we actually already have a coyote that's lived in a small little park in southern Queens since about 2009. And again, the residents of Queens were the ones who tipped off the Parks Department who then tipped us, tipped us off. So we've been monitoring this poor lonely soul all by herself in this little tiny park um, since 2000, 2011 when we started. And she was still there this past winter. We also last summer picked up a roadkill coyote somewhere near Alley Pond Park, I think on the is it the Clearview Expressway? So, so they're, they're, some are wandering, and in, and in true coyote fashion, many of them will die, but some will, will inevitably make it. Um, there's also been reports of a coyote out on the way out here in the Hamptons, I think. And so so we, we have before us this huge area that we think coyotes are, this is going to be one of the, this is one of the last places in North America where they're not. It's Long Island, it's you know, far distant islands like Cuba or, or um, you know, other islands, and the high Arctic. Those are the only places in North America where there aren't coyotes. And Long Island is probably going to, I, you know, you can never, on one hand I can't guarantee it, on the other hand I'd never bet against a coyote, um, or coyotes in general, colonizing a place. So we expect that uh, coyotes will eventually get out to Nassau and Suffolk County, and probably do pretty well there. Uh, Mark, who is speaking tomorrow, will show you some of his models about the paths they may take once they make it through Queens and into Long Island, and maybe some of the habitats or sites that we think would be very promising for them. Um, but ultimately, we want to, oh, I'm sorry, there's also one that seems to be living in the big landfill area on Staten Island, I forgot to mention. Those guys, are, I would bet, are coming from New Jersey, but Again, you can't really know. Um, so what we want to do in Long Island is find these new populations as they pop up, or individuals ideally, but ultimately st stable populations um, of a few coyotes, and find them and keep track of them. Um, we also, and, and that is a really obviously hard thing to do. We have about 40 cameras now, and we monitor 10 parks with them. So to monitor all of this would be, would, would take thousands of cameras and millions of technicians and, and so forth. We also want to kind of get the community ready to coexist with coyotes. And I can talk to, to some degree about this, everyone, I'm, I'll try to get through this because I know there will be a lot of questions. Um, but I think, like I said, coexistence is less of an option and more of just something we've got to deal with. Um, but I also think that it's really not that hard 
things you need to do to live with coyotes are not much more different than things you need to do to live with just be safe anyway um, with your pets and with your kids and so forth. Um, so we definitely want to start interacting with the community. And so that leads me to our Wild Suburbia project, that effort of having as many eyes on the ground as we can. That's the only way we're going to really find them. Like I said, people who told us about that little guy in Queens, there was the residents there. A few other places where we've put cameras up, just because someone told us, I think there's a coyote there. So it's been very powerful to uh, have citizen scientists, if you want to call it that, um, helping us out. So what Wild Suburbia is upstate, it's an effort to, it's a completely online website based. People go in and they tell me what they've seen on their property. Upstate we do coyotes, red fox, black bear, bobcat, and fisher. Down here I'd like to do coyotes obviously, but we also are really interested in fox. And on Long Island you have red fox, you also have gray fox in a few places. Um, and we'd like to learn more about these guys for their, just for, in their own right. They're very interesting and cool. But also we want to know what they're doing now and then maybe something will change once the coyotes get there. So if you were to go, if you're interested in the project, that's the website, wildsuburbiaproject.com. And again, if you're interested, take a flyer. We've pretty much got everything set up on the website. Um, if Click over here on the right side to, do, uh, to fill in a form, fill in a sighting. It asks for... Uh, where you saw the animal, which, type, which species is it, um, and it also will let you upload a picture. We do our best to keep updated maps for people. This is, the, again, the Westchester map. It's kind of a, a pain. I make my students do it to take all of the addresses we get on our online form, put them into Lat Lounge, put them in the Google Maps, put the Google Maps on the website. So it, it, we try to do it as much as we can, but, but they're getting a bit old. But we've got already 400 something sightings uh, for upstate. So most of you guys, I think, are familiar with these species, but just in case, I'll run through. Red fox are smaller than coyote. They're red, they're a fox. Um, they're gonna be the ones you're gonna most likely see in Long Island. They're, probably, they're the most common. Um, we added the foxes again because we're interested in them, but also we didn't want to just say, let us know about coyotes, and then it takes five, ten years for the coyotes to show up. Um, a lot of people think, too, that when a coyote moves in, the red fox are extirpated. I, I myself don't really see that upstate. I see the foxes interspersed with the coyote sightings. Um, but this is definitely something we'd love to test, and this is a perfect opportunity to do that. I was singing the praises of the adaptability of the coyote, but the red fox even puts them to shame. It has the largest distribution, this is just a fun fact, of any mammal other than us and probably a few species of whales. Um, so they're very cool, very adaptable, and they're doing pretty well in urban areas as well. Gray foxes are actually quite rare on Long Island. Mike could probably fill you in better than I could about the specifics here on Long Island. But they're another interesting animal we, we want to learn more about, and we also want to learn more about what will happen to them, if anything, when the coyotes show up. Uh, interestingly enough, if you don't know this, it's pretty cool. Gray fox is one of the only canines that can climb straight up a tree like a cat or a squirrel. So you actually may get in trouble. If you see a raccoon, you might think it's a, a, gray, a gray fox. Uh, so just be careful of that, and the website has information about identifying each of these species. The other thing to note, if you're, if you're going to help us out with this project, keep in mind, if, if you're not super familiar with coyote biologies, especially in, in these parts, the coyotes are a little bigger than the ones out west, and in the winter they grow these really thick coats, and they actually look really big. Um, but they'll get a lot skinnier in the summer. So, these are not the exact same animals, obviously, but you can see the difference in their coats. And so realize that um, you're probably more, you may get mixed up here more likely to with a fox during the summer, and you may get a little mixed up with a dog in this. I have a little, another slide about coyote relative size. So this is a, a coyote we photographed with one of our traps in the Bronx. And this is me coming to pick up the camera later on that, that season. So 
We're in basically the same exact frame, and I brought my dog along. My dog is about 40 pounds, not too big, about an elk hound size. So it comes up to my knee. So just so you can compare me and my dog with the coyote, when Ethan gets in about the same location as the coyote, they're about the same size. And like I said, Ethan's not a big dog. He's not a tiny one either. So he comes up to about my knee. Uh, and that's about what a coyote would do. When we set up cameras, we put them at knee height on the tree. And then, you know, it's coming up just a little bit above my knee. Another coyote showed it up, showed it up, showed up at, whoops, at this, what am I doing? There we go. Showed up at this camera, and he was a little bit smaller, and he's about even with where I am in this frame. And again, he's, he's about up to my knee, maybe a little uphill of me. But that's about the size you're looking for. The other thing about wild canines versus dogs is that they're, they have straight, bushy tails. Not too many domestic dogs have a bushy tail that is also straight. Right? You'll get bushy tails on huskies, but they're curly. You'll get straight tails on retrievers, but they have short hair. You might get a long, flowy tail with like a setter or something. But very rarely do you have these really brown, bushy tails, except on the wild species. The other things with the tails, the foxes, um, the tail is almost 50% of their total length. So you can definitely, whoops, sorry, you can definitely use that kind of as an indicator if you're having trouble. The coyote is simply bigger, it looks more like a dog. The, the foxes seem to be much longer than they are tall. There's another, you know, relative size. Um, so again, everything's online. We'd really like to get the word out. Uh, I'd love to start cooperating with anyone. I, I, we really need people on the ground here in Long Island. I work way up in Westchester, live in Westchester. So it's hard for me to get down here and recruit people. Um, but if you see a coyote or if you think you see a coyote, let us know. We're definitely going to come out and check uh, coyote sightings. We can put cameras up and, and, and look for tracks and stuff. Also, if you see nothing at your house, that's still important information. So you can sign in and say no to every single species. And that's still valuable to me because I know where they're not. You can submit pictures. Uh, we'll eventually get the maps going. If anyone wants to help with that too, we could use volunteers for that. Um, and then fill me in. Don't do it just once. It'd be nice to do it maybe every year. Uh, this is trying to become a long-term thing. We don't know with regard to the coyotes when they're going to show up. But it'd be nice to have a real nice steady no, 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 yes. And we know exactly where they, when they show up. And the foxes, we can start learning things immediately. And we're never too busy. We're, the pro, program's growing nicely. I'm very happy with it. But we're not too big that I can't answer every email you send me. So if you ever have any questions, any problems, if the survey's terrible, Email us and, and we'll always help you. Whoops. So I'm not going to talk too much about specific coexistence uh, techniques. I'm happy to answer questions. I have some experience with it um, because I'm going to run out of time. But I wanted to say something about kind of about it at least about the the topic. The first thing to keep in mind if you're um, maybe nervous or you don't know what to think or if you're a manager of some kind or an official that that maybe deals with communities that don't really know what to think. The first thing to realize in Long Island, they're not here yet. So it's not something you have to concern yourself tomorrow morning. Um, but it's always good to start the outreach, start the education, um, and show the value of these animals uh, early. So the good news is the risk posed by coyotes, and I'll have some stats in a moment, and other wild animals is very close to zero. So that's good. but it, inconveniently is not actually zero. So there's an upside and downside to that. I can never guarantee that no one will ever have a problem. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of techniques, a lot of things you can do, hazing and whatnot, to minimize this risk. And I, and I can talk more about it in the question period. But what I really like to start out with when I talk to people about coyotes and wildlife coexistence is the perception of risk. Um, and what that is, dealing with is, and many of you I'm sure are familiar with this concept, is that putting 
the true risk that does exist, but is very small. Putting that into the realistic con context is very helpful for getting people to, I don't know how to say it without being insulting in a little bit, but behave rationally or make the decision, do the things they need to do to minimize the risk without being uh, afraid or being overly concerned. And what it, so, for example, oops, my nice little animations got messed up. But these are all things that we do that are risky that we live with. We drove, most of us, I think, drove here today. That's riskier than coyotes in your backyard. We dealt with it. Um, and all those other things. In fact, some of us do it voluntarily, skiing and stuff. So here's some, a little bit of data that I dredged up. If you're worried about coyotes or any other wild animal and you own a dog, you also should be worried about your dog. You'd be more worried about your dog. If your neighbor has a dog, you'd be even more worried. And we're not worried. We deal with it, but we're not worried. Um, texting while driving. Everyone here would swear they never do it, but the idiot next, next in the other lane always does it. But you deal with it. If we have 450 deaths a year for people falling out of bed. So if you're worried about coyotes and you don't have railings on your bed, then your priorities are messed up. Sleep on the floor. Or you could easily sleep on the floor. If someone were to sleep on the floor and then come to me about coyotes, that would be, you know, a correct prioritization. <laughs> so the one study I found that actually tried to rate this, um, 142 coyote attacks. So I've, I've done deaths so far. This is attacks. So I'm bad, but not death. Um, about three years since the 60s. So this is the period of time when coyotes were really expanding their range, and there's been two deaths ever. Now, I've never trivialized this, and we have issues with such with pets and stuff, and so I never want to use this as, as kind of, it is a little bit amusing, but it also, people have really lost, had, had significant losses to a loved pet or something like that. It's just, again, the context um, of how, what, what role does this play in your life, really? So, coyotes then fall somewhere between um, vending machines and 10% of the deaths of falling out of bed. So, let me move real quick through this. I don't know what my time is, but, but it's really important. That the bottom line is to keep wild animals wild. They'll, they'll learn the good and they'll learn the bad. They'll learn uh, the bad if, they, if you're feeding them. Um, if they're conditioned in some way to, to expect food or to see people as sources of food or to see a building as a source of food, they will learn that very, very quickly. And that leads to problem. problems. I live on a 300-acre nature preserve. We have coyotes all over the place. I also have a dog and a cat, which I love very much. I fence my yard. It's a very simple thing you can do. Um, I prefer the floppy deer netting to chain link because Coyotes can actually, or many animals, can just run real fast and then scamper up quite a ways up a chain link fence. But the floppy polyurethane or polyethylene plastic fencing doesn't really let them do that. And again, I would always argue that I have a video, if there's time I would play it, of two raccoons beating up a coyote on a camera track. So if you're worried about coyotes, but not worried, you let your cat out now, and then you're worried about coyotes. Well, the raccoons could, could beat the stuffing out of your cat and kill it any time. Car, people, other dogs, all that sort of stuff. Also, greater danger than, than a coyote would, would pose. Like I said, they'll also learn the good. If you aversively condition them, or if you haze them, or if you just make it um, inconvenient or uncomfortable for them, they'll learn to stay away. That they're the ultimate survivors, and that includes learning negative lessons as well as positive. All right, so I want to thank all of our colleagues. This is a bobcat. I just like this slide. No bobcats in Long Island, as far as I know. Or, um, but yeah, I wanted to leave a lot of, I imagine there's going to be lots of questions. I can answer stuff about our research or, or anything else.
Questions? I Somebody have had one over there. Hi. Oh, it's me or someone else? Does someone else have a question? Oh, go ahead. Go. Oh, okay. Um, some graduate student at SUNY ESF in Syracuse, and there are a lot of students there working on coyotes in Jackie Frere's lab. Yes. And one good thing about coyotes is they eat deer. And they found that upstate only 10% of uh, the eaten deer were actually killed by coyotes, but I'm interested in this urban landscape, how their ability to hunt on particularly fawns will change. Have you found any kill sites in Westchester or anything? Um, no, I do have a slide from Dan Bogan's study on their diet. Um, and he found the number one thing was white-tailed deer, but as mm -hmm. he said, it's very hard to tell if that deer that they're eating was killed or scavenged. Um, it's kind of assumed, you know, via data from other places that their, their main source is fawns also. Um, but that's a really big question mark. Um, in the city, we don't necessarily have that problem, but there are deer in some of the parks, and that would be a really interesting thing. What we're going to start now is move and expand on the camera traps this summer. We're also going to add in scat detection. So um, we're going to do manual searches for scat, and that'll help us get um, genetics of the coyotes themselves, but also look at diet. But the main way to do this is looking at scat, as you know. And there's assumptions and problems with that also. But um, I think they could. It, I think. I went to the Wildlife Society conference in October, and, and there was a talk from the guys up in Ontario, and they're finding that uh, coyotes up there are starting to pack up and, and go after deer, just like the eastern wolves. And in fact, there was, were you there? Did yeah. They, so that, they had like two incidences of a pack of coyotes take down a, a moose. Um, now, this is the two in like t 10 years or something, but I think it's something they could learn. And, it, and it'll probably be, you know, behavioral learning, learned skill. But. Yeah, I have a, qu I have a question. Um, yeah. That, that's what I was actually going to ask. Being that there is some uh, wolf DNA with, with these coyotes, have you seen, based on your research, have you seen them forming packs in your area, your study area? The, in New York City, we really never see anything, except when the pups later in the summer are running around with the adults. Sometimes we'll get pictures of five at a time. But other than that, we've never seen more than a pair. And they're, my guess is they're really sticking to small mammals. I think, uh, I haven't run this, but I think if I ran pictures of cottontails against pictures of coyotes, it would probably be pretty strong correlation. That's my guess is what they're eating mainly is, is rabbits. Do you, the other question I have is, do you have any statistics on, on whether there are actually, I mean, you said there aren't here on Long Island, but there's been two, I mean, there's the one that's in Queens that we know of, and then the one out east. And I actually work for a municipality, and where we've had two phone calls where they've said they've had coyotes in their backyard. And I, I was just lucky enough to get the phone call, yeah. <laughs> and I knew what they were talking about, but I had to tell them it probably was, and uh, we're not doing anything about it, obviously, but... Um, I just found that interesting because it, it seems to be such a, 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 a you know, geographical span between Southampton and Queens to think that there aren't any in between. Well, that's, what, that's exactly what we want to answer. Uh, there hasn't been any, whatever you want to call it, official report, but people call, people ask. Uh, we have a lot of people on the ground that go check these out as best we can, look for track and, and scat and stuff, and most of the time so far, the best guess of, of people we sent him says, I think it was a fox. Um, but we will be wrong eventually, because I really think this is going to happen, and there's no reason that if someone were to send me a picture, you know, that would be it. That's what we're looking for. So if it's already happened, then we would just want to get there and record it. The other thing that I would say about that is, again, conventionally, there were not coyotes here a thousand years ago. So this is a species that has to get here rather than, you know, maybe there's a remnant population that's left over. They still have, they have to get here. And, and this is Queens. Basically, the Long Island Sound is the, is the front, uh, the expansion front. Question. Is there any speculation as to how the coyote got out east in the Hamptons? Oh, there's lots of speculation. Um, there's always speculation. I'll just pop back to the map. 
eventually. So there are, for a coyote to make it out there from, by walking from somewhere upstate or even New Jersey is not ridiculous. They could get there in a few weeks. The, where they GPS collar coyotes, they have dispersing juveniles go across multiple states, hundreds and hundreds of miles. So that, so certainly possible for a coyote to walk out there within a season. Uh, there's also coyotes on Fisher's Island. This one, it seems much closer, but if you look at the swimming distances and the fact that it would have to find those little, is it Plum Island? Whatever, those little islands in the middle of water. I, it'd be very hard, but you know, I could never say never with coyotes. I say that all the time. Um, but my bet, I had to flip a coin, I would, I would say I walked out there and no one happened to see it until it got there. But I, no, we don't really know. We hope the genetics will help us with that. Um, if this guy is more related to guys we see in the city in, in Westchester, then that may indicate something. If he's more related to guys in Connecticut, you know, that may tell us something along the Hi, yeah. question. In your area that you're doing all this research, could you tell us anything about rabies with the coyotes? I think coyotes, well, I, I don't know the incidence of, of rabies, the, what rate it, it's at, but I know for rehabbers and whatnot, coyotes aren't rabies vectors, so I think it's fairly lethal. We have had some problems in Westchester where a coyote had attacked some people, the cops shot it, and it was in fact rabid. So it happens, definitely happens, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.